Hello and welcome to Health Reform Watch, a collaboration between Reuters and Forum at the Harvard School of Public Health. I'm your host, David Morgan, healthcare policy correspondent for Reuters in Washington. And with me today is Professor Catherine Baker of the Harvard School of Public Health. Professor Baker is a health economist who served on the President's Council of Economic Advisors during the administration of George W. Bush. She's here today to talk to us about the private health insurance exchanges created by the Affordable Care Act and what we might see in 2015 in terms of costs and competition. Hello, Professor. Welcome to Health Reform Watch. Thank you for having me. In recent weeks, we've seen indications of what premiums might look like in 2015 in the Obamacare exchanges. The consulting firm Avalair did a study which showed a wide range of premium performances, we'll say, from double-digit increases in Indiana to an actual decline, repeat decline, in premiums in the state of Oregon. What I'd like to ask you first off is why we're seeing so much disparity between what health insurance will cost in one part of the country versus another. When insurers set their premiums for the next year, they're taking their best guess about what the health costs of their enrolled population is going to look like. And we've seen a lot of variation across regions and across states in healthcare utilization and in who's signing up for the exchanges. If a healthier population signs up, the average premium might be lower. If a sicker population signs up, the average premium might be higher. And insurers have to take a guess about that for 2015 based on some very limited information about 2014. Hmm. Um, does the uh, disparity between rates say anything about the prospects for increased competition in some of these marketplaces? Well, one of the forces that may bring premiums down is if there are multiple insurers competing for enrollees, and enrollees are likely to choose policies that offer them the best value. They need to know what they're getting from the insurance policies, and they need to be able to switch if the policy isn't meeting their expectations. So I think we'll see some variation across states, both in who signs up for exchanges and how likely they are to switch across policies based on the competition between insurers. Hmm. Is the size of enrollment a factor as well? Some have suggested, for example, that some of the highest premium increases could come in states that either rejected Obamacare and the Obamacare exchanges or embraced the Affordable Care Act and set up their own exchanges, which then didn't work. I think it's more the composition of who signs up for insurance rather than the raw size. In some states, they made it easier for people who liked their previous plans to keep them, even if those plans didn't comply with Affordable uh, Care Act requirements. In those states, if healthier people chose to keep their previous plans, then the pool signing up for new exchange policies would be sicker and premiums might rise more. Mm. In states that made it easier to sign up for the exchanges where younger and healthier people were more likely to sign up, then you might see premiums rise by less. So I think it's about the type of person who's participating in the exchange more than just the number of people itself. Do you have a feel for how large an increase in premiums some people may may see in 2015. I mean, how, how bad might it be in some places? I think preliminary evidence is suggesting a fairly wide range, as your intro outlined. And that's going to vary by regions and by states. Individuals are not individually underwritten, meaning if you happen to be sicker, your premium's not going to be higher. There's some variation in premiums based on age and gender and a few other factors, but largely it's driven by the parts of the country where healthcare spending is rising more quickly or by insurers who guessed a little too low when they set premiums for 2014 and have to amend their guesses by more for 2015. Mm. Uh, it seems that some of the customers, some of the people who enrolled in Obamacare policies are finding that the products they purchased are disappointing in one way or another. Do you have a feel for how serious a phenomenon this might be? I think there's a real tension between people's desire for premiums to be low and people's desire for health care policies to be unrestricted. If you want premiums to stay low, insurers are going to have to use some tools like cost sharing for individuals, like narrower networks where insurers reduce the number of 
providers that insured enrollees are able to see, and that creates some tension, some competition among providers to be part of that network. Individual enrollees don't really like cost sharing in narrow networks, but they do like lower premiums. And I think we have to accept going forward that if we want premiums to rise more slowly, there are going to be, have to be some restrictions on utilization. And so what that means is that someone enrolls in a plan seeing an attractive premium and then finds that the deductible is high or finds that when they need to fill a prescription, they have to pay 20% of the cost or they have to pay a high copay. Is that the idea? That's part of it, although some features of insurance plans like that are reasonably easily observable when people sign up. I think we've heard a little more concern about narrower networks because that might be harder for people to see when they first sign up because they don't know what provider they might want to see until they get sick. So that's been a greater source of consternation because it's less visible to people ahead of time when they're choosing an insurance policy. On the other hand, it's a very powerful tool for insurers to use in negotiating with providers so that they get competitive prices for their enrollees. Hmm. Is there a potential for this to become disruptive at some point? Well, there is the potential if people who initially signed up for insurance policies find that they're dissatisfied and don't re-enroll, that could very much change the risk pool. We also are likely to see premiums increase for other reasons, such as the phasing out of subsidies for insurers that's built into the law. So enrollees might find that their premiums are going up and they're not quite as satisfied with their benefits as they had hoped. Mm -hmm. And that has the potential to be disruptive. At the same time, the Department of Health and Human Services has released information about uh, subsidies, which shows that something like 87 percent of those who signed up for plans did so with uh, the help of uh, premium tax credits, and that the average tax credit payment is about $264 a month per enrollee. Does this suggest that the cost of these marketplaces might be higher than was originally expected? I don't think that's out of line with anticipated costs. The goal of the law was in part to increase health care coverage or health insurance coverage by subsidizing enrollment for low-income enrollees. And the fact that there's been high take-up of that I don't think is necessarily a cause for concern. And I don't think that the dollar amount is all that surprising. Mm. Then what's your general expectation for 2015 and the years to come? Are the marketplaces going to be stable? or is the jury still out? I think that there's greater hope for stability than originally suggested by slow sign up. So there was great concern in the beginning of the open enrollment period for 2014 that young and healthy people weren't signing up. They tended to sign up later in the window and I think that they're likely to continue to sign up. So that suggests a growing pool with a better mix of risk, meaning premiums should be relatively stable as long as people continue to be insured. That said, I think that there will be necessary changes in insurance design along the lines of cost sharing and narrower networks that are going to make the insurance coverage that people have look different as time goes on. Professor, thank you very much for an enlightening conversation. Thanks also to our viewers who have joined us for this edition of Health Reform Watch. I'm David Morgan. See you next time.